And Klaus, at your presentation, you seem quite worried about production systems. I mean, made production systems. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Yeah, because uh, my experience is that people talk about beef production and they mix different things, which means it starts with a, um, where the beef comes from, and uh, which can be coming from dairy, like in about two thirds of Europe, the basis for beef production is the dairy herd. And that means that you have different kinds of animals, different ages of animals, uh, you would probably have different uh, qualities of meat, but that's, a, that's an ongoing debate, of course. Um, and you would also have a different policy influence and framework influence, because everything in Europe that affects dairy, milk, affects beef. Whereas you have other countries where most of the cows are beef cows, and they are actually kept for producing a wiener calf, that will then be shifted to a finishing enterprise or has an intermediate stage of what they call backgrounding, for example. So you have to draw a line between these enterprises if you want to do proper analysis. Like uh, you have to draw a line between cow-calf and the beef finishing, which is basically by our definition everything that comes after weaning of the animals. You are doing benchmarking for a long time, comparing mm -hmm. all those different, quite yes. different systems. Which are the conclusions? Uh, well, the conclusions is, um, first, if you look at countries, you, you look at regions, let's say, wh which are in similar economic conditions, let's say. So let's, let's just say we look at Europe, we, we can include North America except Mexico, but US, Canada, and you look at South America, you look at Africa, but that's very diverse, again, and you look at Asia, Oceania. So what we found actually is, um, uh, since we have been doing this, which is now 15 years, that in terms of prices and costs, the world is getting smaller and closer together. That is because uh, the classical example would be Europe against the rest of the world, let's say. So I'll give you two examples. Um, uh, Europe versus South America, you would have seen a price and cost difference in 15 years ago, which was a factor of between three and five the difference. Now with the price and cost increases uh, in South America, which were much higher than in Europe, uh, this gap narrowed and you have now a factor of only two, if at all. Now for example, Argentina has costs which are in US dollar terms, almost at the level of European farms, of the good European farms. The other example is uh, the US and Canada, where you saw similar developments, more dynamic developments then in Europe. And at the moment, 2015, the cost of production for beef in the US was higher than in, in our European farms, which is a really a fundamental change and which has, of course, to do with the exchange rate developments. So the weak euro makes Europe more competitive and makes our cost in expressed in dollars lower than the Americans. And what uh, can that imply for <coughs> trade, supply demand balance mm -hmm. uh, at the medium term, yeah. not to say the long term? Well, um, it is, let me say, it's only one factor, of course, uh, determining and influencing trade. Because uh, I think it was mentioned by some people, these, uh, let's say, game changers are s sometimes just shocks. Like BSE was a, was a trade game changer completely. You saw before that the US exported a lot of meat to Japan, to South Korea. They were basically kicked out of these markets overnight and Australia took that place. Now they basically came back during the 2000s, they came back to this. Uh, so the cost and price differences are not always the, of course, not the only reasons. But one thing you can clearly see, if you look at the top 10 beef trade flows in the last, let's say, 10 years, you can clearly see that a lot of the South American trade went away from Europe towards other countries with higher price levels than Europe now, like China. Also before, uh, also to Russia, to Middle East, to Northern Africa, because there we have markets which, with, which have now higher price levels than, than uh, the EU. And that was a traditional market for South American beef. They did not just have the Hilton quota, they even exported uh, substantial amounts of uh, beef uh, out of quota. So at the peak time, Brazil was more than 300,000 tons to Europe. Uh, of which 
most of that was out of quota, which means at a very high tar tariff rate. And now you see this picture has really changed. Um, so this trade flows moved away from Europe to other markets. Are these flows sustainable? <coughs> How do you see South America needs, and specifically beef production, mm. uh, in years to come? Well, clearly with a, with, a, with a large potential, as I have shown in my uh, presentation, a lot of that beef from South America is pasture-based. Argentina now is a certain exception because they have shifted to feedlot, so you can roughly say 50-50 is pasture and feedlot, so that was a complete paradigm change in Argentina from this gaucho thing to feedlot, uh, which has many reasons I, don't, uh, I will not talk about now. So there's clearly a big potential. We also did some studies in Colombia on, uh, on intensive, intensive silver partial systems, which are very, very profitable, but need capital investment and um, know-how, advisory extension. And I think this, you, you cannot copy that from, uh, from Colombia to any other place, but there is also potential for other countries. So yes, there is certainly a, a big potential, especially for South America, but we must not forget especially in the case of Brazil. You know, people always talk about Brazil, they will flood the world with product, everything. Beef, milk, pig, chicken, corn, soybean. But also Brazil has some limits, and they have, you have a competition between the different products and enterprises, and then the, you have to look at the gross margin per hectare, which gives you more. And we have seen even in Brazil some farms, they were basically they kicked out some cattle and, and replaced by cash crops because they were more profitable, and Argentina is another example. So I'm saying this because uh, a lot of people in Europe still believe that uh, if we do anything about our tariffs, we will be flooded. Um, and uh, that is partially true, but we also must, must uh, acknowledge that uh, there's the potential is not unlimited, but it is there. Uh, that's, uh, that drives me to a question. Would be uh, interesting for both Mercosur and South America mm. and European Union mm. to go with a free trade agreement because, as you say, it, it, it has always <coughs> been said that that would be a, a huge threat to the European mm. Union mm. agriculture sector. Mm. But you, you seem not to see it uh, as much as that. Uh, well, <laughs> put it this way. Uh, let, let, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about a WTO agreement, which would be globally. In that case, I would say that the damage would be very reasonable because of these other markets. So imagine they would, everybody would have access to all markets. For example, Indonesia is for Brazil a very interesting market because it's a high price. They don't have a quality of product differentiation. So the Brazilians could send a lot of sheep cuts to Indonesia and there are 200 million people. And so that, that is a very interesting market. Um, so I think with the WTO agreement, which we will probably not see, as we know, uh, it would not be such a big issue. But the Mercosur is a different thing, because you open a valve between two trade areas where you still have, as I said, significant differences in, in cost. Uh, and that would certainly create some damage to the European beef industry. I'm, I see this differently to TTIP, for example, where at the moment I wouldn't see at, with these cost and price relations at the moment, um, I wouldn't see such a big uh, uh, damage. Um, and, and that is why the negotiators, I think, uh, they don't talk about uh, zero tariffs. They talk about quotas. So that, that's, that's why. Klaus, and uh, finally, you said in your speech that it's more important the know-how and management mm. than technology. Mm -hmm. You seem to be worried also about technology as, as, uh, as a simple concept. What do you mean by that? Why, why you compare management yeah. and technology? Yeah, thanks for, for this, because it might have been misunderstood that I'm, a, I'm against technology. I love technology, and technology is a driver for all economies, without doubt. Um, all I wanted to say is that it doesn't help you to have high-tech uh, products and it doesn't help you to have uh, high-tech genetics if you cannot feed the animals. Like, you know, you have seen many examples like dairy animals being exported to developing countries with a yield potential of more than 10,000 kilos per year, but you have to feed them properly because they need the high energy, they, they, you know, because they can only eat 
20 kilos dry matter per day, and, and that's, that, that's it, and they shut down. So if you don't produce, if you don't give them feed that is um, um, appropriate to their uh, yield potential, that is something you can, uh, you, then you cannot manage technology. So, and that is why I was rather focusing on these low input or relatively low input and easy to achieve changes in these pasture, pasture systems, which I took as an example. But it, you know, I could, can also imagine, for example, think about drones and think about remote areas, like uh, for example, in Australia, Northern Territory or Queensland with these big ranches, you could use drones to supervise your cattle. You, you could just send them around and, and, and see where your cattle are. That's an example. And I see more technology coming, of course, in terms of uh, genetics, in terms of breeding, which means if you do a cross cattle with a Nilori, with, a, with, a, with a, a British beef or even continental beef, and you can take that through the health and the feed requirements in these systems, then you will have a real big potential to produce more. And that, of course, involves in technology. Mm -hmm. Really? Klaus? 